That's right. Timeless. You can sing them to any generation. That is, if you know about the power of the blood. If you know about the cleansing power of the blood, perhaps the older we get, the more we understand about it. The more we know about the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus. Eternal God, our Father, we're thankful, Lord, for this moment. We're thankful for your presence in our midst. We ask now, Lord, that you would teach us through your word, teach us through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. May we be receptive. May we now sit at the feet of Jesus. I ask that you would hide me behind the cross. I pray that you would illuminate our eyes and our understanding so that we might see the truth and act accordingly in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you would, my brothers and sisters, turn in your Bibles to Exodus uh, chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. From the Word of God. Exodus chapter 1, beginning with verse 8. From the word of God. Then a new king who did not know about Joseph came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with hard labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their hard labor, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, he said, when you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe them on the delivery stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God, that's right, yeah. So God was kind. So God was kind to the midwives. And the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. May the Lord bless the hearing and the reading of his holy word. Uh, let the people of God say amen. amen. Uh, the subject of our sharing this morning is what success looks like post-civil rights. What success or victory looks like post civil rights. Mm -hmm. In our text this morning, in spite of the oppression that the Israelites suffered at the hands of the Egyptians, God gave them success in two areas. Number one, the text says that the more uh, the Egyptians oppressed the Israelites, the more they multiplied and spread, the more numerous they became. That's the first area. Secondly, the text says, because the midwives feared God, 
They didn't carry out the king's command to execute the children, but instead they saved every male Hebrew child that was born during that time. Now, I imagine they could have been killed for their insubordination, but these women feared God, and they did what they knew the Lord wanted them to do. And the Bible says that God blessed them because of that. Now, I also want you to notice in this text, outside of those two areas, I also want you to notice the sequence of events that describe how and why the Israelites became slaves in Egypt. All right, number one, it tells us in our text that a new king came to power in Egypt who didn't know Joseph. Uh, he didn't know about the contributions that Joseph had made to save the Egyptian economy and the world during that time. Number two, it tells us in verses 10 and 11 that this king enslaved the Israelites based upon a lie. And generally speaking, lies are always at the root of the oppression and the subjugation and the dehumanization of people. Look at verses 10 and 11. In verse 10, the king said, come, uh, let us deal shrewdly with the Israelites. In other words, let us find a way to control them because if war breaks out, they'll join our enemies, they'll fight against us, and they'll leave this country. Now, that lie, which is what it was, that lie was based upon fear, perhaps the king's envy, and also a corrupted and paranoid mindset about the Hebrew people in general that could not be substantiated, all right? And number three in this sequence of events, it tells us that when the king realized that his plan of oppression wasn't quite working like it was supposed to, and I want you to understand that this happened over a 400 and 30 year period. Moses was born during the end of that time. So it says the king, but you've got to understand that every king that came behind this one were of the same mindset. And I even thought that perhaps because the, 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 the word is singular, king, perhaps uh, in, a, in a real sense, in a spiritual sense, the Bible is talking about the king behind these kings, and that is Satan himself. All right, But it tells us that when the king realized that his plan of oppression wasn't working like it was uh, supposed to, you know, the midwives, they didn't obey him. The more he oppressed the Israelites, the more they multiplied and spread instead of being destroyed. Uh, it tells us that the king then told his own people. He told them that all baby boys who were born to Hebrew women should be killed and thrown into the Nile River. Now, you know, my brothers and sisters, I hope that you're able to see without me even saying it, that this sequence of events in our text more or less has been played out over and over and over again in the persecution of people throughout history. And so when the Bible says there is nothing new under the sun, there really is nothing new under the sun. But when we look at the Bible, and when we look at the activity of God's people, and when we look at the ministry of the Lord Jesus himself, we find that even in the midst of struggle and oppression, significant victories have been given to God's people, especially when they are attuned to him. All right? Now, we must understand that victory and success, the kind that God gives, uh, it may not be reflective of what the larger culture calls victory and success. For example, the virtues and the values of the kingdom of God are different from the kingdoms of this world. That's why Jesus said to Pilate uh, when he was in his custody and he was about to be crucified, uh, he said to Pilate, he said, if my, he, said, he said, if my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight. They would take up arms. They would take up weapons to secure my release but my kingdom is not of this world. And so success in God's eyes may be very different from the culture in which we live. Now, in our text, in our text, success is what we see the midwives doing. And what do we see them doing? Saving lives, all right? Success in the Bible is what we see in Luke the 15th chapter in the parable where the shepherd goes searching for that one lost sheep. He has a hundred sheep, all right? Ninety-nine are safe, but the Bible says he goes looking for that one lost sheep, and then he finds it, all right? Success is what we see 
in Jesus' ministry as defined as he defined it himself in Luke, the fourth chapter, all right? It's, it's setting the captives free. Uh, it's giving sight to the blind. It's healing the sick. It's releasing the oppressed. And it is preaching the good news to the poor. That is the kind of victory that God celebrates. That's the kind of victory that God sees. That is the kind of victory that, God's val that God values. And so what is the question? And what is success post the civil rights struggle? Well, let me tell you what I, what I don't think it is. I don't think it is necessarily living next door to someone of European descent. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. But I don't think uh, that speaks to our success uh, as it concerns the civil rights movement. All right? Success is not living in a subdivision of houses owned and designed by European and Middle Eastern architects, businesses, and landowners. I don't think that's what success is. Success is not driving the top of the line cars. It's not being able to go to the same stores and restaurants and shopping malls and entertainment districts that we were not allowed to go to at one time. Nothing wrong with that. That's the, how, that's the way we live now. But I don't think that that is the success necessarily. That's not where real success lies when it comes to the civil rights movement. Success is not simply, simply, and I'm qualifying this, okay? It's not simply being accepted or treated kindly by people who at one time thought of us as being barely human, all right? Now, now listen to me, listen to me, all right? Quite naturally, I believe that if you believe that Jesus is Lord, you should always treat people with respect and kindness because they are people, all right? And when we do that, it strengthens our bonds, it affirms our humanity and equality and respect and love for each other as being members of the same race, that is, the human race, and it affirms that we are brothers and sisters in the Lord. That's what it does. But I don't feel that I should get all giddy if someone from another ethnic group treats me with kindness any more than if someone from my own ethnic group were to do so, all right? And my brothers and sisters, just because, just because someone is nice to me doesn't mean that there are not some critical issues that are still on the table that need to be dealt with. And so, my brothers and sisters, I believe, I believe from a biblical perspective that success for us, like it was for Jesus during his ministry, like it was for the midwives in our text, like it was for the shepherd in the parable in Luke, the 15th chapter, like it was for Harriet Tubman with the Underground Railroad, success for us is to be free enough to carry out search and rescue missions for the lost and the downtrodden among us. Uh -huh. That's what I believe success is. Success, post-civil rights, should be about strengthening what little we have left. For example, you know, we have our personal stories and we have our history and we should pass those on to our children. You know, we believe in the goodness and the faithfulness and the mercy and the salvation and the power of God. And so we ought to teach our children how to worship and praise the Lord. Many of us are educated and we should, we, we should teach our children how vital and necessary education is for their future. And so success for us should be about it should, should be about supporting our people wherever we can and whenever we can. And I believe that our resources should be dedicated to that, all right? Success, for example, may mean that our homes need to be smaller so that uh, we won't have as much debt. Uh, our cars, perhaps, may need to be less expensive so that we will have more disposable income to give to our children and our remaining institutions, all right? Success for us in this country needs to be about saving lives. That's right. Uh, who can we save? Who can be set free? Whose eyes can we open? Uh, who can we heal? That's really where fulfillment in life comes from, doesn't it? Doesn't that mean, isn't that what it really means to follow Jesus? Fulfillment in life comes, doesn't come from things, but it comes from a mission and it comes from purpose and it comes from doing what God created and fashioned and saved and redeemed you to do. That's what success and fulfillment comes from. You know, I have this picture in my house of a black man, and he's lying on his chest, and his head is down. You can't see his face. And he's leaning over a ledge, and he's reaching down with this slim, 
strong, muscular arm. And he's reaching down to grasp the hand uh, 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 of someone that's upraised uh, to him. Uh, to me, that's what we should be doing post-civil rights. Reaching down uh, to lift some of our brothers and sisters up. You know, when a fireman runs into a burning building, success for him is whether he is able to rescue those who are inside the building and bring them out to safety. Now listen, that's what the midwives did in our text, didn't they? Uh, they rescued children living in this fiery house of oppression, and they gave them a chance to live. That's what success ought to be post-civil rights. You know, it ought to look like Harriet Tubman, one of my favorite freedom writers. I talked about her at the 11 o'clock service on last week. One of my favorite freedom writers, Harriet Tubman escaped from slavery, became a free woman, but then she went back into the lion's den, not once, not twice, not three times, not five times, not 10 times, not 15 times, but 19 times or more to free her family and others from slavery in the South. Uh-huh. Success post-civil rights in this country for us ought to be about saving lives. It ought to be, in a sense, about, about going back into the lion's den about running back into that burning building to save those who want to be delivered, all right? Now, in our text, in our text, it says that a new king came to, pow came to power who did not know Joseph. A new king came to power who did not know Joseph. You know, I know many people, perhaps many of us, would like to think that we live in a post racial society. You know, I don't even like the term race because we don't use it, in, we use it incorrectly, all right? We use it incorrectly, but that's the term that we're familiar with, all right? Uh, and a true exposition of this text would talk about who this king was, uh, the time frame in which he came to power, and who Joseph was, and what he did, and how God was working during his ministry. But I'm approaching this text from this perspective. There are always principles and metaphors in Scripture that teach us about human nature and the things that we face in life, all right? Now, just like a new king came to power in Egypt for about 45 years now, for about 45 years now, there has been a new face to racism. Just like the abolitionists formed the Underground Railroad, which was a covert way to free slaves, and quite a few abolitionists were white, and we ought to know their names. As a matter of fact, uh, we ought to know the names of Jews and those of European descent uh, who helped and died in the struggle for civil rights. We ought to know that because we ought to know that God has people in every single ethnic group upon the face of this earth who are willing to fight for justice and truth, and we need to celebrate that. But for about 45 years, all right, there has been a new king, a new face, of racism in this country. It has been a covert way and language and method of dominating and controlling people of color in this country. And as Michelle Alexander pointed out, the one who wrote The New Jim Crow, and uh, Deborah Small, the executive director of Breaking the Chain, that they pointed out, it was the reaction. It was the reaction to the civil rights movement and perhaps even the riots that happened in the late 60s all across this country that precipitated the rise of the Black Panther movement. And, and, and the riots that I'm talking about happened in Watts and Detroit. But right upon the heels, right upon the heels of the movement, there was a white counterculture reaction to civil rights. That's right. And as the children, and, and, and so the children of those who supported slavery and Jim Crow and the overall disdain of black people did what during that time? Well, number one, they left the neighborhoods and they left the school systems and they stopped riding the buses and they left the cities and they took their money with them. The property values of the neighborhoods and the cities, they went down and the property values of the neighborhoods they moved into went up. And during that time, many of them did everything that they could to get away from black people, except for the athletes and the entertainers and a few others, if there was a way to make a profit off them, all right? Now, now I'm not saying that things didn't get better for some of us, 
But all that we love, Dr. Martin Luther King and singing Kumbaya, you know, it doesn't measure up with the facts that are on the ground. After Dr. King's assassination, one of the reasons the civil rights movement perhaps lost its force is because when the white-only signs were taken down, when segregation on the books now, not in reality, but on the books now, uh, was no longer legal, when blacks were given the right to vote, when we could go to the places and the stores that we couldn't go to before, I believe it became difficult to focus on the obvious threats to the African-American community. Uh, we, were, we weren't prepared. We weren't prepared to deal with the covert racist attitudes that remain in the hearts and the minds of the oppressor. We weren't prepared to deal with how these attitudes would be passed on to their children. We didn't really think about the economic juggernaut that had been amassed from centuries of free labor in this country when we left our own businesses in order to patronize theirs. We didn't really think about how pervasive racism was, not only in the South, but in the North, the East, and the West. No, perhaps we thought that because some laws were passed, we, we things would get better, huh? But, but we fail to recognize that we were still at war. That's right. We were still at war. Now, 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 my brother, I don't think, I don't think that many of our brothers and sisters in the ghettos and the projects and the neighborhoods in the north, the west, and in some cases the south, I don't think they fail to recognize this. But perhaps overall, we fail to recognize that we were still at war. But let me tell you, I am convinced that one of the reactions to the civil rights movement has been the war on drugs. Hear me now. This war has primarily been waged against black people first and then brown people and poor people in this country. That's right. Yeah, yeah. This war on drugs that President Nixon started has been devastating in so many ways to the African American community. Uh, it has broken up families, it has perpetuated the myth and the hatred that we have for ourselves, so much so that an NBA basketball player can say the same things about rioters in Ferguson, Missouri that I heard a police officer say on CNN. He said there are a bunch of animals and, and, he, and, and no one called his behind on the carpet for that. No one called his behind on the carpet for that. That's right. So President Nixon started this war on drugs. And then President Ronald Reagan took it to another level. Even though drugs, drug use in this country was declining. And then President Clinton issued that three, three strike rule in your out mandate. Uh, and he talked about reforming the drug policy, but, but his walk didn't measure up to that. And, 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 they, and they couched this war. It has been couched in such a way that it led many people to believe probably many of us to believe, that African Americans were the primary drug offenders, which was and is a lie in this country, and that, we were gonna, and that they were going to clean up drugs, and they were going to save our communities from this scourge. But instead, instead of going after the drug cartels, instead of going after suppliers of the drug trade in this country, they went, listen, they went after they went after low-level, nonviolent drug users and dealers. Then they made using crack cocaine, which reportedly more black people use. They made that a worse offense than powdered cocaine, which reportedly more white folks use. Marijuana possession became a felony, but not LSD and meth and all the other drugs that white Americans use. As a matter of fact, listen, the empirical evidence shows that whites use drugs at a higher percentage than blacks, all right? Hold on. The National Institute on Drug Abuse, the National Institute on Drug Abuse reported that white students use cocaine and heroin at seven times the rate of black students, and they use crack at eight times the rate. Now listen. Even though African-Americans are 
12 to a little over 13 percent of the population. We account for 35 to 37 percent of drug arrests, 55 percent of drug convictions, 74 percent of drug sentences, and the sentences that African Americans receive are 10 percent longer than white offenders for the same crime. And drug arrests, listen to me, are the largest single U.S. arrest category. As a matter of fact, you will find that all of the drug laws and policies and propaganda in this country, they were targeted to control and create a permanent underclass among our people and now poor people in general. And that's the truth. There is empirical evidence that shows everything that I'm talking about. Now, 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 most black men in the system have been arrested. You'll find it's hard to believe, or maybe you won't. Most black men in the system have been arrested for non-violent drug crimes of a low-level nature, but they have received harsher and longer sentences than many rapists, extortioners, and murderers. All right? All right. Once you are felonized for drugs, you are felonized for life, meaning that you are banned from voting for a long time in most places, and you're banned from life from voting in some other places. All right. Uh, it means that you're banned from public housing. You're banned from most forms of employment. You're banned from receiving money for higher education, which means that maybe about a million of our men are either unemployed or underemployed. Yeah. Now, if that doesn't make you want to holler or hit or stump something, I don't know what will. Huh? I don't know what will. That's right. And so the war on drugs was a racist lie that was used as propaganda listen to me, for the mass incarceration of our people yeah. since the late 70s. Yeah. Yeah. It's empirical evidence like that that should remind you that we don't live in a post-racial society. Yeah. All right? And you know And when you look at what happened to Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown and Eric Gardner and that beautiful 12-year-old boy, Tamir Rice, who was shot in Cleveland, by police officers, and there are countless others. And to my knowledge, none of those police officers have been convicted of anything. Then we must never forget that we have a fight on our hands that must still be waged, and unorganized riots, and marches, and gatherings, and protests that don't have a strategy that will affect anything, or don't have teeth that will cut anything, or don't have a hammer that will crush anything, will not do it on this battlefield. It ain't gonna do it. It ain't gonna do it. If you're gonna organize and protest, you need to have a strategy about what the outcome of that is gonna be. Now, personally, personally, personally I don't see how anybody over the age of 40. Matter of fact, I don't see how anybody over the age of 38 can't see how those shootings that I just mentioned weren't racist. I don't see how you can see it. As a matter of fact, it insults my intelligence. When CNN or Fox News or some other, and some other TV program, they have the gall to even ask the question because they know, they know the attitudes of their daddies and their uncles and their cousins and the family members of their friends. They know those attitudes, all right? They have the gall to even ask the question, was this something that was racially motivated, huh? You know, in a way, you know, in a way, I'm even mad at myself <laughs> that I didn't see this any earlier. Mad at myself. Some of my friends have been in and out of the penal system for a very, very long time. And you know, ever since I was young, I could feel something was wrong, all right? Uh, I, I didn't like certain things. I wouldn't go for certain things, but I really didn't see it. I didn't really have the sight like I should have. I knew that just because those white signs were down didn't mean anything, but there were times when I just couldn't, I couldn't put my hands on it. Couldn't put my hands on it because I had a certain amount of protection and privilege growing up. But like, but like so many of our sisters have said, there is a link from slavery to segregation 
to the mass incarceration of our people where the powers that be in this country have used extreme punitive measures to control and destroy many of our people. All right. And so, and so any effort or any form of resistance or strategy to save some of our people must be well thought out. It must be bathed in prayer. It must take future generations in mind into account. And it must and take into account the reaction that will come after. All right? Now, when you look back at our text, what did the midwives do in our text? They saved lives. What did Jesus do during his ministry? All right? He helped people. He, 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 he healed people. He taught people. And he saved lives. What did the shepherd do in Luke, the 15th chapter? He went looking for his lost sheep. All right? What did Harriet Tubman do? She went back into the lion's den to bring people out of slavery. That, my brothers and sisters, is part of what success ought to look like post-civil rights. Amen. The doors of the church are open. doors of church are open. We invite you to become a part of us. Not a perfect church. We're striving to be all that God would have us to be.